Hello, fair listener, and thank you for downloading this episode of the Emotion at Work podcast. Now, before we get into the episode proper, I wanted to let you know that my guest and I discuss miscarriage in this episode. Um, so if miscarriage is a difficult subject for you or something that you are uncomfortable listening to or hearing about, then uh, this episode is one that you probably want to, to miss. Just wanted to let you know before we get into the episode proper. So here we go. Episode 49. Hello and welcome to the Emotion of Work podcast where we take a deep dive into the human condition. Um, now one area that I grapple with regularly is how um, in the work that I do I put emotion kind of front and centre um, and I had some feedback recently to say that I could frame it as people engagement uh, or change or, or something that might be a bit more maybe corporate or a bit vogue um, and I just don't go for that really. Um, and when today's guest and I started talking one of the, the questions that went through my mind was um, kind of what they lead with so today's guest is leading with love which for me is super inspiring because you know I lead with emotion and that can be tricky enough for people to get their head around whereas my guest today is leading with love in the in the work that she does um, and so I'm just really excited to kind of get into our conversation and I was also thinking about previous episodes of the podcast, and, and this will be the first one where we've explicitly talked about kind of leadership in the framing of this um, podcast and in, in the title, because today's workshop is all about emotion at work and power of love leadership. Um, and so my guest also taught me about leadership because uh, in really difficult times. Um, and so it's an honor and a pleasure to welcome onto the podcast, Sarah Higgins. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm absolutely How thrilled. How are you doing? Yeah, fab, I'm thank absolutely you. thrilled to have you here as well. <laughs> this is so exciting. It's my first podcast. You've that done other things, been... haven't you? You've done a TEDx talk as well. I did. Yes, I did that um, at the end of last year, which was amazing. You know, as, as somebody that's been quite into it, leadership and self-help and all that kind of stuff for many years it's you I've, lo- I've watched so many TED talks and TEDx talks to that to actually get the chance to do one was was really cool and uh, I was very grateful for that and I'm very very grateful to have you here with us today so thank you so much for coming on thank you now, what I'd like to do that's all right. So what I'd like to do is to open up with our unexpected yet innocuous question. Um, and and I, I think what must have been going through my head when I break this one down was maybe my aspirations and dreams. So um, my question for you is what makes for a good weekend break? Oh, gosh. Um, well, the first things that come to my mind are being with my husband and my daughter. Um, Okay. So my husband, who I've been with for 30 years, and my daughter, who's 13, and they are my absolute world. And just being anywhere with them is amazing. So, yes, it would be somewhere with them. But the place that I love being with the most is by the sea. So I suppose okay. quite simple for me, really. Um, ideal weekend break would be going somewhere by the sea with my husband and my daughter. I'm very sort of quite simple in those sorts of things and that I would be that that yeah very easily pleased (laughs) probably fish and chips probably you know seaside English you know UK seaside somewhere yeah wonderful (laughs) um for, for me it would be about it being different so one of the things I love about weekends away is, is doing stuff that we just wouldn't normally do at home. Mm. So partly, I guess that's about being in a place that's where you, you know, because you're, you're in a place that isn't home. So therefore that's different, but also just kind of changing up the routine so that we're, we're doing things that we wouldn't normally do. Um, you know, so I, I get, a, I'm not grumpy would be a bit of a stretch, but sometimes I feel like it was, it's a, like a bit of a loss if we go away and then we just end up doing the same things we would have done at home. You know, like if we just get up and, 
play on the switch and watch ipads or you know we would do stuff we would normally do at home so for me a good weekend away is is difference you know and it's, it's doing stuff different doing things in in yeah, doing different things or doing things in a different way yes. to, to how we would normally do them at home yeah no i get that yeah <laughs> And you mentioned that um, uh, that your husband and your daughter are kind of uh, all of uh, all of your world. And one of the things that really stuck out for me um, in your book when I was reading it is how, even though you've you framed this as, as power of love leadership, this is something you use in in all aspects of your life. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. Um... When I when I actually developed the model back in um it was about nine years ago now, eight, nine mm. years ago, when I started coaching leaders early on in my sort of setting up my own business, and I created the model based on lots of I, th- I think it was about a place that I was at the time. I'd read a lot of I was reading a lot of things. Mm. Um I mean, even things like I don't even think I mentioned this to you before, Phil, but you know, law of attraction, um mm-hmm. And, you know, the secret and that's kind of stuff I'd been reading. And um, I've been reading Louise Hay, you know, Heal Your Life and um, Brandon Bay's The Journey. So I suppose I'd been doing okay. a lot of, you know, self-reflection, thinking about, you know, that's how kind of, I mean, we'll get onto that, I guess, but where the love and the fear comes from a bit more. But I've been doing a lot of um, work on that coming up with the model and um, using it with leaders and they were really responding well to it because it was allowing them to kind of rationalize where they were and helping them to think through where they wanted to be mm. and then um and this was kind of where I went into with the TEDx talk really that you know the, the personal journey that I had on the back of that because I didn't when I when I designed the powerful of leadership as a model I didn't think I'd be using it in my own life but when I when I'd had three miscarriages and I realized that I was not in a great place, really, mm. I was sort of, was really struggling emotionally, just sort of not on the outside, not that anyone would have seen it because I did a really good job of just being, you know, smiling and still being doing everything I needed to do for everyone else. But I just knew that I wasn't necessarily present all the time with my daughter because I was just, I was crying a lot and just felt very angry with my husband because he'd said he didn't want to try again and Mm. you know I was angry with myself because you know I'd gone through those experiences and why wasn't it working and I just thought you know what because I had had my model on the wall I just thought you know what I need to use this myself and it was just a challenge that I set myself to just be authentic but if I'm helping leaders with this surely I need to be able to use this myself and I remember looking at this model thinking right come on then you know and it was I can honestly say it's, it is one of the hardest things I've ever done. Do, doing this with yourself, yeah, it's blooming hard. Um, and it, I had to use it every day, and um, I had trial and error, and some days were good days and bad days. But uh, probably over a, after about a year of using it, and there was a long story, obviously, within that. But yeah. after about a year, I can kind of I could look back, and I did not feel the same as I did, and I was much happier, much more at peace, and I'd let go of a lot of those emotions that were obviously very unhelpful for me at the time um and after that experience I then decided to talk to my daughter about it so she was about five then Mm. she's 13 now um and because I had the model on the wall and and she just started school we'd end up talking about it so she'd come home from school and she'd have an experience where she was upset about something and I just thought you know what I've used this with leaders I've used it with myself how about trying it with my daughter Mm. and the whole experience of helping her to unravel that feeling that she was having that that maybe was unwelcome or she didn't find it very nice or she was upset or crying or angry or just unraveling helping her to unravel that and then thinking about strategies or emotions or ways of thinking that might be more helpful for her to practice mm-hmm. she she just lapped that up and yes she needed guidance with it and it was trial and error again with her and but you know she's 13 now and, and we we talk about the the strategies and the uncovering your fears and what's going on underneath it and we talk we just talk about it daily now and um, and when I wrote the book I think I just in order for it to be real um, 
I just wanted it to be real. And therefore, rather than just keeping on applying it to leaders, I think the main audience is leaders. Yeah. But I yeah. think I wanted people to know that as leaders, we are people as well. So, you know, yes, it's about how you lead others, but it's also about how do you lead yourself when you find challenges or difficulties or things that maybe are bringing you down or overwhelming you or you're struggling with. And then maybe how could you use it in your own life with people you love? So that, so I guess it was just, a, I guess it's a story of how you can use it in day-to-day -day work, which is mm. the main story. But actually there are principles and practices that you can use personally as well, because we're not just, I mean, we're human beings at work, aren't we? We, you know, we, we have a whole life around us especially more now that we're online and work and home is so much more integrated isn't it than ever before mm, definitely so I hope that explains <laughs> so it, it, it does one of the things that um I think we should probably do for the listeners benefit is talk about the model because we you I mentioned it you mentioned it but we haven't actually talked about what it is yet so we should probably do that in a moment and, and just describe you know kind of describe the model and, and, and unpick it um a little mm. Um, one of the things that um, that you mentioned there about, you know, we're human beings at work. I remember um, when I was doing some, uh, I guess, broadly speaking, leadership development work, but it was also kind of culture development work with um, uh, with a client a few years ago. One of the phrases that I introduced there was, you know, that, that we are human beings. And, and I've seen other people use this phrase as well, so I can't necessarily say it's mine. But, um, you know, we are human beings. We're not human doings or human thinkings. You know, we we, we be and, and we be everywhere. We don't just be at work. You know, we're human beings who be at home, who be at work, who be at play, who be, at, you know, in, in whatever way. You know, so we can't just expect people to come up and turn up to work and just do stuff because they have to be you know and they have to, mm. to, to be and they, they have to be okay to be able to do well if that makes sense in that in, mm. in, in that way um so yeah you reminded yeah, me that. of that um so i remember when we have our our, our pre-call you talked about how when you first came up with the model you would kind of you you'd um you'd bring it out and you'd put it on the 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 method you know the desk and, and you talk somebody through it now for, I, I was then thinking well for our listeners then they're, they're not going to get that visual so we will definitely put a visual in the show notes so yes. if fair listener you want to um you want to have you want to have the visual as um as sarah talks through um the model then you'll find the link to the visual in, in the show notes where you can where you can get hold of it um so uh, yeah if you want to if you want to kind of see it as well as hear it then uh, you can definitely grab hold of it as it were um, so where did the model begin or where in the model did you begin then, Sarah? Did you begin like at the, because there's a bit, there's a few different components to it. There's a bottom and then a middle and a top and some bits down the side. So when you were putting it together, where did you begin with it? Um, well, it began with, um, there's some, there's some principles. Um, okay. So the main elements of the model are um, fear and love and yep. the things that we um, can feel that, in the model are based upon fear and some things that we can um, do and think about and behave in certain ways, which I call strategies, which are based mm -hmm. on love. Okay. Um, and the principles that surround all of that are um, one of them. There's about eight principles and it's things like um, mindfulness, um, self-awareness, um, being able to use our imagination and visualization and um not having blame, all those sorts of things. But the, mm. the one that where it all started really was internal and external locus of control. Okay. Um, and I remember when I, um, I'd become qualified as a coach when I was actually still a HR director. And then um, that, well, that's great because when you become qualified as a coach, you know all the, as an executive coach, you know, you know all the principles, you know, you know how to do it and all that kind of stuff. But when I when I got made redundant as a HR director and I decided I was going to, well, I thought I was going to set up my own business. Mm -hmm. I actually got a, a coach myself who'd yep. sort of been there and done it for about 10 years. Um, and she 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 taught me this, this internal, external locus control. And she used to draw it on a line and a piece of paper. And she, her name's Nikki V. And she was absolutely amazing for me in terms of helping me to develop my own style and be authentic to who I am. 
and she she used to say if ever I had a challenge she just used to simply draw this line a horizontal line with an arrow each end and one end would be internal locus of control the other would be external locus of control and she'd say you know so where are you on this and what she meant by that was internal locus control is to what extent do you believe that you've influenced this unbeknownst to you or this is not about blame but and to what extent are you taking some responsibility for you know how you influence this and and the the whole premise is that if you have an internal locus of control you believe that you influence the things you believe that you can influence mm -hmm. you know things around you to make them better and make them right and it does have a link to focusing on what you can control not what you can't it has a link a bit to that mm -hmm. but the other end is external locus of control is where we believe that things happen to us that we don't influence them that that you know all the maybe the bad things or things that are happening to us it's kind of like outside of our control and the thing that then can become attached to that is blame you know okay. so we, we we perhaps to make ourselves feel better we attribute that unfortunate thing or the challenge that we're having to someone else or to something else okay um and that that what she kind of taught me was that there is a a real power in realizing that we do have a choice that there is an element of responsibility that we can take for situations and it's very empowering um and i just loved it i just loved that mm. whole concept um that you know when we're when we are in challenging times or we're feeling a certain way that, that actually isn't what we want to be feeling but actually to, to think what can i do about this right now how can i take more control how can i feel more empowered how do i realize that I didn't mean to be in this situation, but I probably did. Maybe not. So if you take an argument yeah. with someone, for example, we quite often we get annoyed because someone's hurt us or they've made us feel a certain way. You know, like an argument, say if I have an argument with my husband or something, mm. you know, you, we can very easily go, Ooh, you know, they do this, they do that. They've made me feel this way. But if you take an element of that internal locus of control, you can say, yeah, and I probably didn't listen as well as I should. Or I, I probably, you know, um, I probably said something that maybe touched a raw nerve before, mm. before we responded in the way you did. Or maybe if I hadn't left the washing up for two days, it might not have wound him up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. It, so that that was the underlying principle, to be honest. It started so simple. And I, I used to draw that line then with my clients. And then, as I said earlier, because I'd read all this other stuff and perhaps all the influences over the years of all the HR work and just everything came together. And I just ended up drawing this model with fear and love. And I think probably at the time there was a law of attraction link there. Um, but I just developed it. And, and the model that you see in the book, in mm. fact, I've actually developed it since the book. Um, okay. <laughs> well, I've got, it's got more, um, instead of it's got lines in the middle and it's actually got some nice pictures in the middle as well now some of some um, nice icons but you tell you what then so you, you can you i'll can give you the new one yes yeah. yes um and yeah so that's where it started and i just developed it and it, it yeah it's just developed from there but the concept is that we all have things i'm in coaching i started to realize that you know there were when people were talking to me about what the challenges were so whether it was you know my team are struggling at the minute or they're not performing or I'm finding it hard to be motivated at work or my boss I don't get on with them or mm. um, uh, someone on a board and the uh, an NED that they were working with was challenging them and it made them feel uncomfortable or whatever it was for me when I simplified it down it seemed to come down to some sort of fear or insecurity or some sort of blocker in terms of their beliefs um, and so I just sort of started to draw simply fear mm. and then as people were talking about it then, then they'd then describe how they were feeling and then I just sort of attributed a lot of those those thoughts or feelings or blockers around the concept of fear and then I started to work out, you know, there are actually some things that you could be doing differently. And let's talk through those strategies. And it occurred to me, and I'd read a lot of stuff about love and fear. And, um, and you know, there's, there's a very, well, there's a, there's a quote by John Lennon, actually, which was done in the 
must have been the 60s where he actually says that you know life is about not you know not being under the shadow of your fear it's about actually learning to see the light through through love and I've paraphrased it but that's generally what he was saying and yeah and that's then that how the model came about and it's just it was just my way of making something visual and easy for people to grasp so that they could try and understand themselves a bit more and understand how they could influence others more effectively. Okay, so so we've got so to, to try and paint a picture for the listener. Then, on the on the right kind of on the right hand side, there is a, a spectrum then, which has got the locus of control side of things in terms of internal t- tools. The, the and it's a vertical line. So you've got in, internal towards the top, uh, internal locus of control, and then you've got external then towards the the bottom. Um, and then we've got at the bottom of the the model going across the page then is, is fear and then you've got a number of other aspects that that you know, and you said these were the kind of the descriptors that people were giving around things like disappointment criticism sadness anger shame envy worry guilt yes. doubt frustration resentment those kind of yes. along the bottom and I guess they that's were the not most a, common ones yeah I was going to say that's probably not a prescriptive list is it it's not like they're the only things but they were the, the common ones that people were giving is that right yeah generally when I talk it through with people I start with the you know people will tell me about their particular challenges and then I, I'll say to them so what is it that you're thinking feeling or experiencing right now what's and I show them the model and the concepts of fear or blockers or things that might be getting in the way or things that might be feeling uncomfortable. And it just the visual thing helps people to talk it out. Um, even though the words that they might be attributing or if they were to put a word to what they're experiencing might not be the words that are in this model, mm. somehow those words that are there allows them to use their own. Um, it, it, it brings out their own interpretation of what that is for them. Um, and which which people find really really helpful it helps them to sort of rationalize or put out there what actually is going on and and I found I found over the years that that's the that's the most important thing with you know dealing with our challenges or um, things that we feel are getting in the way is actually to just let's just unpick that then it's the most uncomfortable thing Mm. um, that we find to do but it actually is really necessary to just explore it and I think in the TEDx I used the word to be fear de- fear detectors detectives that's it okay yeah, yeah you know actually just to become a bit of a become more curious you know mm. and there's actually more recently I've just been exploring this more myself you know is just to sit with that you know the, sometimes that uncomfort of not being able to just resolve that challenge and and click your fingers even though I know all these strategies, I've been using them for years, nearly 10 years. It's still, I can't just click my fingers half the time and, and, and make it okay. Now I know I need to use more humility or I know I need to use more gratitude. So therefore I just know that, so I'll do it. I actually have to, what I call process the emotion mm. and work it through and explore it. It's, it, it's I've, I have found anyway, it's it's the way in which I can then move forward and find peace and find more joy and let go of some of those feelings that actually or experiences that have been blocking me and been unhelpful. Mm. So, yeah. So at the bottom, you were saying, sorry, Phil, you were saying at the bottom of the model is all the fear. Yeah. And yeah. That's in red. Yeah. Um, and, and I want to stick on that just for, for a moment, if that's OK, because there are a couple of bits in what you said that. Um, that I wanted to pick up on so one is I, I agree with you in terms of the the labeling of emotion and the the articulation of that in in some way or somehow is really really important you know and for some people that might be articulating it through you know words and saying this is the emo- labeling and naming the emotion for other people that might be about um, describing the sensations you know kind of mm-hmm. describing where it is in them um, because I, I get fascinated that when I'm stressed, uh, the first place I, I notice it is in between my shoulder blades. You know, it's mm-hmm. not that I, I'm not consciously aware of it, but I can just feel the, the I can feel the tension mm-hmm. kind of in physiologically before I can necessarily um, uh, kind of linguistically put a, put a name on it. And I remember when I first looked at the model, I was like, oh, fear, really, Sarah? Come on, no. <laughs> all about fear is it um 
but it doesn't really and you know and if i was going to be a discrete emotion you know kind of discrete emotion theorist about it then you know a load of the stuff that's linked to listed at the bottom isn't all about fear but at the same time i can i can see how by giving somebody that framework even if those words aren't the right words for them by giving them some words it prompts that thought into well if it's not those what is it or if it is yes. those then it's one of those you know and yeah and it gives them a, it gives somebody a way of of labeling or articulating that feeling even if it may not be you know exactly in line with what you know it's not like you as a coach are going to sit and go well is it really fear or is it actually this you're saying it's this but is it actually that that kind of doesn't matter does it really because no. it's about what the person's feeling and what they kind of think or, or feel it to be yeah I, I have found that it makes people feel it's safer somehow people have said to me just seeing those words on a piece of paper or seeing seeing that has made made them more able to say it to speak mm. it out and to just explore it it is weird isn't it in a way that we would perhaps need to have that but it's it's a very uncomfortable thing for us to do um yeah. but it's a very necessary thing for us to do and we should my my you know one of my beliefs is that we should just become a lot more comfortable with opening up about these sorts of things I, I agree completely you know the um you know the there's one thing to be able to go i'm emotional in terms of I'm, I'm feeling i'm feeling something to be able to then kind of be more discriminate and go i'm feeling this or i'm feeling that or i'm feeling the other especially when you know and i can't talk globally but you know if i think about kind of uk cultural norms then those UK cultural norms would be that you don't spend time clearly articulating what you're feeling because actually most not most that's probably unfair there are there are people who feel uncomfortable having a conversation about how someone feels and yes. and you know, uh, um, and it's really fascinating when so when one client I worked with there was one um it was almost like if you'd said how you felt then that became like a trait of yours. You know, if, if you were to say, I'm, you know what, I'm really angry about that decision that you've just made. Um, the, it would then become like a, a label that was assigned to you that oh, feels the angry person. Like, no, no, that's just yeah. how I felt then. I'm like, I'm not angry now, but at that moment in time, I needed you to know that I really disagreed with what you were saying or the decision that you were making. And I was angry about that decision you're making because I think it was the wrong decision. Um, you know, I had to have one of those conversations recently with, um, with something I do in my volunteering life where, you know, somebody had taken a decision. I was like, nah, I just don't, I fundamentally disagree with your decision. I can't change it, but I need you to know that I disagree and I need you to know why I disagree. Um, but that felt, you know, that felt hard to do because I know that's not how you, how it would normally be done. If that makes mm. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I mean, it, we're not taught how to deal with emotions. We just, you know, one of the things I'm really passionate about, and I'm, I'm so glad they're doing this now in schools or they're starting to, but, you know, this whole concept of, you know, understanding how to maintain mm. our emotional health as much as we do our physical health, because mm. we teach children how to maintain physical health at school through PE and those things. Um, but we, you know, and I, and I just, I don't know when we'll get to the point where we can actually, where our children will feel that they understand and can talk about openly their emotions but I'm just I just feel so passionate about that that we just aren't taught and we are you know we we, we were kind of most of us you know we nobody's fault it's just how it's been you know we just get well up most of the time to sort of squish those yeah. emotions you know yeah. we, we feel a certain thing when we're kids we come on pull yourself together you know yeah yeah um, don't don't do that now don't cry about it um and that's so well meaning and so well intentioned and actually sometimes that can be the most helpful thing that we need but what a lot lot of us learn is to just then not explore it let's you know let's not let's not pay attention to it let's hide it um and not show it and therefore when we do have quite strong emotions we don't really know then how to explore them how to express them how to talk about them yeah. Um, and we try and dismiss them, but the strong ones or the ones that are really meaningful just don't go away. And it, it, it I mean, I talk about everyday fears, everyday 
you know, some people might call them micro stressors or, you know, all these things can have different different terminologies. Yeah, yeah. But I talk about everyday fears. So I talk about things like, um, you know, skepticism and um, like, you know, sort of mm-hmm. being sort of mistrusting about what what is that other person's intentions. So, you know, if we get mm. an email and, you know, I had someone, a leader say to me the day I got an email from somebody and immediately I just thought, what the flip? You know, yeah, why yeah. are they saying that? Where's that come from? Why didn't I know about that? Blah, 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 blah. Why are mm. they saying it in that way? And they they just went off into this kind of anger or, you know, defensiveness sort of feeling and emotion. It was only later on, after a few days of them boiling and you know, having this whirling around their minds, and, and they found out that it wasn't anything like that at all, you know. But we have all these everyday fears and things like, you know, overanalyzing things, procrastination, mm. because, you know, we might not make decisions because we, we're fearful of how it might turn out or we avoid things because we're, we're a bit fearful of whether we can do it or make it right or whether it be good enough. Um, we c- can criticize things. Um, and we can have, we get, I think the thing I see the most actually is with day-to-day fears, frustration. Um, and a lot of these things all come from a good place. Mm. Um, so frustration is generally, I see it in, in um, you know, leaders being really passionate um, and maybe, you know, things just aren't going right or somebody's not doing what you needed them to do or not responding in the way that you wanted them to. Um, and then that frustration actually turns into anger, um, mm. at least from a lot of other people's perspectives, even though inside you it doesn't feel that way. It feels like just passion um but you know guilt and shame defensiveness not speaking up doubt you know resisting change resentment envy envy i quite often see in people day to day um you know because we we just we just want to achieve so much we want to do so well Mm. and then sometimes we see someone else doing well or we perceive that they're getting something that we would have liked or an opportunity or you know whatever so we we feel all this stuff it's just normal human day-to-day stuff but we we're not taught you know how to uncover it how to embrace it how to learn from it how to talk about it how to open up Mm. how to be vulnerable enough to know that it's okay to have those feelings and that we all have them yeah and that it's okay to have that conversation like you did so Mm. i'm doing some workshops with quite a few of these at the minute about actually you know when you do this whole thing about you know what's what what's going well what's not going so well but actually you know when when do we really get most frustrated when are we at our happiest and when do we get most frustrated and let's get that out let's talk about it um I did a a workshop um, yesterday with a leadership team where we talked about what do we think each member of the team adds and makes when the team is at its best but how does each member of the team detract from the team being at its best? And there were nice. a lot of things in there about, you know, when somebody gets overly passionate, they, that's their strength, but they overly use it, which it then becomes their, I mean, you could call it weakness, but, you know, a lot of yeah. us say development areas, don't we? Um, it becomes their development area because yeah. actually they become too... Um, set in their own ways they won't listen to others and they just get so focused on doing it their own way um so yeah i think i've gone off there phil sorry don't worry it's okay tangent. <laughs> it's all right no it's good it's good it was a good tangent to go on um okay so we've got we've got our locus of control uh, on a, in a vertical line on the right hand side of the middle then across the bottom in red we've got fear with all of those other feelings um or, or kind of uh, yeah, feelings or stakes that we described across the bottom and then on the left there's another spectrum there's a, a horizontal another vertical spectrum um which has got the word vulnerability in it so you mentioned vulnerability um in, in what you just said there so do you want to talk mm. us through that kind of spectrum on the left and, and what does that represent yeah well about halfway up on the left is self-awareness which um which i think is really important because something i mean i said i guess it's linked very much to what I just said about uncovering, embracing, learning to understand what we're going through, what we're feeling, Mm -hmm. finding a way of understanding it and expressing it. So self-awareness is absolutely critical. Um, 
I mean, generally in terms of leadership development, being the best you can be as a leader, you know, self-awareness is absolutely fundamental to that. Um, you know, and some would say you you can't necessarily be a great leader to other to others unless you fully understand yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think with this model, it's it's very much about learning to be become much more aware of what's going on with you so that you can then adapt and use the strategies that are in the model, which obviously we'll talk about in a minute. And I think vulnerability is an important one you mentioned because actually to be able to use some of these strategies, mm-hmm. it, they will feel uncomfortable. You know, we'll be pushing ourselves out of our comfort zones. As strange as it sounds, um, sometimes what we do when we're feeling or experiencing some of these other fear-based emotions is that they're not helpful to us, um, people will say, but they actually can be strangely comforting. Okay. Um, and sometimes to actually come out of them is is quite fear. It's quite fearful in itself. Mm. Um, you know, if you say, for example, so let's just say, for example, um, I'm angry with my boss because my boss has done something to me or done something which I believe is unfair mm-hmm. um, and we can feel anger about that um, and it feels justified yeah it feels like we should be feeling that thing because you know the way that we see it what they've done is kind of gone against a principle or a, a standard that we hold mm. um, and actually holding on to that can feel comforting yep. even though that anger is perhaps limiting our effectiveness. It might be, like you're saying, it might be causing stress in our bodies. It might be meaning that we're becoming demotivated at work or that we're becoming angry with people around us or even our teams. So that's the unhelpfulness of it that, you know, through the discussion we can uncover. But even though you then say, well, do I want to change it? Yes. You have to embrace vulnerability to then be able to use some of the strategies that we're going to talk through one of which, it, two of which actually, compassion and forgiveness. Mm. You know, to be able to work through, right, okay, in order to be able to let go of that anger, you know, putting myself in that person's shoes, thinking about where they might be coming from. Um, you know, and I generally say, you know, forgiveness, it's not about saying that what that person did was okay. It's about being able to let go of it so that you can be okay. Mm. You know, and these are not, again these are things we're not taught to do but they are things that will allow us to be able to process that emotion and then be able to let go of anything that might feel unhelpful and allow us then to be able to and this is the whole point of the model really and right at the top of the model it's it allows us to be able to be more resilient more creative more focused on our work to have more health and well-being to make more effective decisions that aren't clouded by maybe these unhelpful emotions to build trust with people to be effective in our work and to be emotionally intelligent and to be motivated. And that at the end of the day is the reason for it. It's not, oh, you know, that person's not been, that person's made me feel a certain way and I should be nice to them then. That Because a lot of people think, oh, it's just about being nice and it isn't. It's actually mm. quite strategic. That's why I call them powerful strategies because using them will make such a difference for you as a leader, for your teams and for your organisations. I've, I've stopped myself there, Phil, because I'm, I know I could just, I feel myself <laughs> so excited, so passionate about it. And I'm thinking, yeah, bring it, rein yourself in, Sarah, rein yourself back. So keep me in line, Phil. That's, if, I felt, if I felt the need to rein you in or bring yourself back, I promise you I would. I promise you I would. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so, you, so you gave us a link there then to, to some of the outcomes and the results that you talked about. So you talked about resilience. We, we also got uh, so these are kind of the outcomes at the top of the model. So we've got resilience, yeah. health and well-being, creativity and innovation, um, effective decisions, trust and authenticity, personal effectiveness, emotional intelligence and, and, and motivation. And I guess um, in in. Uh, uh, I suppose, is that what it's all about for you in terms of the outcomes and the results of, of what this model is trying to achieve for people? Is it is it that stuff at the top that you're trying yeah. to, to support individuals, leaders, teams, yes. organisations to, to get to? 
where yes. those things that we yeah, that we've been through are available to them or available for them yes so in the book they're called the benefits you know why would you why would you even begin to look at this or use it or you know what particular outcomes might I be trying to achieve if I did do this and yeah. work my way through this yeah so I call them the benefits and for me it's the sort of the so what really you know if I because it, it's hard work doing this stuff you know if it was yeah. that easy we would all be doing it every day um but it's hard work and I and you know and I think it's a commitment to say actually I really want to achieve those things those eight benefits and or any particular one of them and therefore I'm going to commit to doing this with myself or my teams or in our organizations so that you know we can start to see more of the benefits of that or or there might be pockets of good things going on but actually how can we have this in a more consistent way Hmm. and so one of the um when you were talking earlier on about about what your personal situation where you you felt you you know you were like right if if i'm going to say this is a model to use then i need to use it for me Mm. um and you mentioned that um that it was hard and it took effort and, and energy to to get there and one of my reflections um you know having read the book and gone through the model was um how accessible it was you know how, how easy it was to kind of get your head around how accessible you made it how accessible the language is how accessible the strategies are um, and then I also had a feeling of but well, that must be really hard work mm. it must take real kind of discipline and um, an effort and, and, and energy to to achieve and I guess you could argue that that's the case of any kind of you know emotion regulation um, activity that, that you might have to do so how, how did you how did you approach that kind of discipline or how did you approach that 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 work that you that you needed to do and we don't have to necessarily talk about that example if you don't want to um you know but in terms of yeah, yeah how, how how do you what do you do to help you with the discipline or the 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 persistence that you need to to get those outcomes that you're achieving at the top do you mean you know when you said not necessarily have to use the example did you mean the the one that I used in the book or with me personally or so the, the, so the miscarriage one in particular I guess I was thinking yes. about it because you used that earlier on so you don't have to use that as an example if you don't want to you can use something different as I guess I, yeah. I heard a change in your voice when you talked about it earlier on and, and I don't want you to feel uncomfortable I suppose well you know I've got <laughs> I've got more used to talking about it and making and I, I've got more used to and I know this is something Brene Brown says actually about research that she's done on vulnerability is that the people that the people that she found that kind of ended up having better results were people that knew it was necessary do you know what Mm. I mean that that you have to just see it as a necessary thing that you're going to feel vulnerable but you just get on with it anyway and I think I think that's the key really um and I mean, I think what what I love about the model is that I just learn new things every day. Mm. That, that there's no, it's it's not cut and dried, black and white. Um, there's no tick box formula. It's not oh, I'll use this and then everything else will be fine. You can you can you can use it. I mean, I've used it. So I've, I tell you the the, the I mean the, the example in the book I think I put was um you know, being annoyed at when I'm driving. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) This is one of the ways in which I've used it. And it's the quickest thing. You know, it it can work instantaneously for me. Um, You know, one of my (laughs) beliefs and sort of things that I hold very dear to me is kind of probably fairness and people being kind to each other. And, you know, when I'm driving along and being considerate of others on the road and then, you know, do you know sometimes I make an innocent mistake like I get in the wrong lane Mm. right and you try and you signal a signal and I try and get in and people just kind of close up to each other and they don't let you in as if to say you shouldn't have gone in that lane and I'm not letting you in and you can you can almost you know and I'm mind reading of course yeah yeah yeah. but I can feel their anger you know and I can feel myself getting wound up and I'm you know or you've I've queued up for half an hour in in a lane you know, because maybe a lane's blocked off and then someone yeah. shoots down and cuts in, you know, stuff like that. And so it's all about that instant, um, you know, something 
flicks and I'm absolutely like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So we all do it. But I know it doesn't feel great. And I, I when I started to use the model more, I used to think that doesn't feel good. You know, that kind of rah, inside me and whatever. And I'm sure I don't need to be feeling like this before I go into my meeting or as I'm trying to take my daughter to school or, you know. So I just worked it through and I worked through compassion and forgiveness. And I just thought, oh, my days, do I, you know, that person's done this, they've done that and whatever. But do you know what I thought? How can I imagine that from the from the kind of the bottom of their heart that they were maybe having the best of intentions? Because with the thing with compassion and it's, you know, empathy is putting yourself in someone else's shoes and mm. trying to think about where they might be coming from. And I always encourage people to think, you know, even though you don't know that person or you probably never get to meet them or understand it, how could you imagine that? Um, imagine that, you know, what they've done is actually with the best of intentions, that it hasn't come across in the right way or the best way for you, but what might be going on? And I just mm. imagined that they were zooming down the fast lane and cutting everyone else off because they were on their way to see their gran, who they just found out was ill in hospital. And, you know, they love their gran so much that they just needed to get there. Mm. And as soon as I thought that, I just felt forgiveness. It was weird. And yeah. I just use it all the time now. Um, or, you know, you can't you can't park going, you know, dropping my daughter off to school and I can't park and everyone's kind of like honking horns and you're not meant to be there and get out my way and whatever. Mm. And instead of thinking, oh, you, you know, cutting me off or getting my space. How about if I imagined that when I park up behind them, I actually know them and then they're my daughter's friend's mum. Right. Would mm. I be would I feel angry with them? No because I would know them and I would have trust in them and I'd know that they're a nice person. So I just imagine this stuff and it works. Now with, with the, you know, after the three miscarriages, it was, it was one of the biggest events of my life because I just felt so much emotion attached to it. Mm. It wasn't just the miscarriages. It was the fact that, and that, that, you know, I did feel guilt, shame, anger with myself, but it was also then my husband who didn't want to try again and I um I was just devastated because he it was almost like then he was another barrier because yeah. I just thought well, I'll just keep going I'd, mm. I'll I'll pick myself up and have another go and whatever um and I had the whole emotion of loving someone so dearly who didn't seem to want the same thing as me um and the, the resolution in my mind would have been let's just keep going and therefore he wasn't resolving it and I, I had so much anger issues to him as well to resolve mm. and I and just I can honestly tell you that every time I just had to be so self-awareness was really key I just had to become aware every day of what I was thinking and feeling and what what is this actually the most helpful thing right now why am I feeling this thing what is it trying to tell me where is it coming from mm. And I could feel every day that it was coming from those things I've just said to you. And I, I can I can summarise all of those emotions and feelings so clearly for you right now because I had to do that every day. Mm. And, and then what I did every day was I looked at the strategies and I would say, right, okay, which, which ones am I going to use right now to help me with that feeling because it, it actually isn't helping me right now. And there were so many that I just needed to use every day and it just takes time on some things that are a lot deeper or a lot more I guess at a deeper level I mean you know like I say you can use it quickly with the you know someone that's wound you up mm. I, I was with a client the other day and they'd you know they they were just trawling through emails and you know someone had sent them an email and it wound them up because they've worked so hard with this person to get them a certain place and this person was like I still don't understand and I'm not happy about it and and this client was like oh my goodness I'm so busy I haven't got time for this why are they not and we just you know we explored what was going on with the mm. feelings but then we went through the strategies and we explored things like um compassion and forgiveness but generally actually saying thank you for telling me gratitude mm. thank you for telling me that you're still grappling with this because actually if I didn't know that we I would have probably just gone on regardless thinking that you were okay with it Mm. um and we went through all these strategies and afterwards she said I just feel so much better about that yeah I'm just gonna go off and write them an email now that's done you know some of that sometimes you can use them and they work instantaneously um sometimes actually they take a bit longer 
you know, I think there was an example sure. I'd said to you before where someone had um, upset me in front of other people or and said something I just mm. felt really embarrassed about it. And I I kept working it through. I kept working through compassion and forgiveness because it's the one that comes up for me so often about when someone has hurt me or made me feel upset about something. I put myself in their shoes and I think, OK, so where were they coming from at the best place of, of inside of them, from the best place of love? And what were they really intending? And, mm. and then perhaps I can forgive them and let it go because I know that they didn't mean it to come across in that way. And But it still wasn't getting rid of me just feeling that kind of in my stomach upset with them annoyed with them and I knew that when I next saw that person I was still going to have that feeling yeah. of a little bit of annoyance and anger about what they'd done and then I just I looked at gratitude and it just worked for me so I thought you know what what that person had done for me up until that point I was really grateful for and actually when I next see them I'm going to say to them thank you for doing all of those things that you did and that made me feel better Gratitude's probably, I mean, I love all the strategies. I've used them so many times. They're like, yeah. it's strange to say, they're like, they're not little babies, are they? But they're like, they're just like so important to me in terms of how we use them. But gratitude, gratitude, I always find is like a, it's like a calming effect. Um, I remember being at an award ceremony once and I was so excited about winning this award many 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 years ago and when I didn't win it I just felt so upset and I know we shouldn't feel upset and I know we always say to people mm. you mustn't feel upset joy in being a finalist you know you should feel grateful and I I didn't didn't feel it to start with I just went off to the toilets and I just sat there thinking oh and I thought you know what okay gratitude I know you work and I just got my phone out and I wrote down what am I really grateful for right now mm. and I wrote these things down on my phone and I just felt this just enormous peace and love and it was lovely I went back out enjoyed the rest of the night it felt great (laughs) how weird is that maybe I maybe some of them are better for me because I've used them more I think I often talk about um I can never say this properly so I'm gonna have a go new neural pathways yeah okay yeah um Having learned that, you know, we we can actually build new neural pathways in our brain by, you know, learning things, practicing, um, you know, and then we become more used to doing that thing. So it becomes easier um, mm. and we have to think about it less. I think that's the thing with these strategies is that, you know, you become more self-aware, you practice them more and the more you use them, the more instantaneous they can become, you know, the more resilient you can become about dealing with things in the moment more yeah. instantaneously because they just come to you more easily um yeah so, so we should we should probably talk about them all because we haven't quite talked about them all yes. yet so so the first two you mentioned then in, in no particular order so one was compassion yes um and, and in, in our pre-record off air one of the questions i asked you was um uh you know can compassion go too far to the point where i know i love that yeah so do you want to talk about that that might be a useful Will you finish off your point okay it's a really good point. yeah so my question was can, can can you know can that compassion and that empathy go too far um and and there's a uh, there's a lady called kim scott um who's who's kind of put together a, a model and one of the um one of the quadrants because it's a two by two which means you need to be in the top right corner because whenever there's a two by two model you should always be in the top right corner um um, but one of the quadrants is this idea of ruinous empathy, where you feel so much empathy or so much compassion for someone uh, or for a situation that you that you then don't do anything about it. Um, yes. You know, you you kind of uh, you accept the uh, it's a bit like um, the other thing that I see talks about in the HR press sometimes is the um, obnoxious star performer. You know, do you, you know, no, I suppose that's not the same thing. That's something completely different. So I'll, I'll, I will stop myself there because that's something different. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the idea that you can be so compassionate and so empathic, so understanding that you don't actually address the situation or address the thing that's making mm. you in, to use the model. You know, there's something going on that, that's causing you to have one of those feelings at the bottom. And then compassion can help you with them um, with the reframing of that and thinking about that in a different way but also it, that compassion could get you to a point where you then don't do anything about it yes 
yeah so how, how do you I, I guess the question then is how did how do you rationalize that away within the model so i think the the thing that i have learned most over the years about my using it with myself and using it with others and seeing how they've come out using it is that the real test is am i using compassion from a place of love or a place of fear so when we so what we can often do is we we you know there's a client of mine who who says you know they've got a lot of leaders in their business who will just they won't you know they won't pull people up on poor performance mm. you know they won't they won't um engage in the conversations they they're in fear of conflict they're in fear of actually being able to say to somebody you know this is something we've talked about so about something we expect or you know the performance that we've agreed on and this is working really well right now but actually this isn't quite where we need it to be hmm. and that is something that they've noticed that their managers are, are not very great at doing and you know they will say or oh, we're being you know we're being kind to those people because we're not we don't want to upset them you know we don't hmm. want to you know make them feel like they're not doing a good job because they're working hard or you know whatever but actually we do it from a place of fear quite often because we don't want that person to not like us or to be annoyed with us sometimes we don't say something because we don't want to deal with their emotion mm. you know we, sometimes we 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 fear actually what is their response going to be it might be that they're not happy with me it might be that they become demotivated it might be that they um you know become resentful of me it might be that they are upset that they're not doing a good enough job therefore i'll make them unhappy so we 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 overly think it all but actually it's i would say it's on the basis of fear mm. if you do it from the place of love it comes from the place of i'm going to do this and say this to you right now because actually this is going to help us to resolve a problem this is going to be what we need to do which is for the best for you it's for the best for the organization because if we don't have this conversation this is only going to get worse mm. and and for me when you do something from the place of love you do it from the place of, of of actually needing to do the best outcome for all of the people that are around you and and not actually then for your own interests and we don't think about it like that but if you really think about it that is often what happens yeah I was, I was doing some work with a client as well recently and i reframed it as are you being nice or are you being kind yes because the night being nice would be to not say anything and to spare their feelings and to you know to, to not address it but that's not being kind because the kind no. thing to do is to say that's not good enough and I want to help you and I want to support you and I want to get to a point where what you're doing is good enough. Yes. But that's not good enough. You know, exactly. and, and that's the kind thing to do, whereas the nice thing to do or the, maybe the polite thing to do is to go, oh, 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 not to worry, not quite what I expected. Thanks, Rain. <laughs> thanks anyway. Um, you know, that's, that's the, that might be polite and nice, but that isn't kind. And there's, um, there's a lovely bit in one of my favourite videos. I have two favourite videos that um, I often refer to, to people to. One is the Brenny Brown Power of Vulnerability, where she's just, it was one of her early ones, and she's so yeah, vulnerable yeah. and so funny. But um, the the other one I love is Patrick Lencioni's um, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Mm. Um, and he he brings it all to live, alive in his stories and anecdotes. And there's one story about him being on a, like a church group Mm -hmm. and you know they're all discussing ideas you know for the church fate or something I may have got all the details wrong which is just how I remember it anyway yes yeah, right um and they're all you know talking in the groups in the in the group every week or whatever and we, all these ideas and this one woman keeps saying we should have balloons we should have balloons and he said and we're all sort of sat there sort of trying to delicately look at each other as if to say no we don't really want balloons but we all go yes absolutely and we all nod you know and we don't say anything we don't disagree with her. We don't actually want to hurt her feelings, right? So, but we all come out of the meeting. We all go, oh, do you know what? I wish she'd shut up about them flipping balloons. You know, why she keep going on about them blooming balloons? Anyway, this goes on for a few months and then she finds out that, you know, they were all going on about her balloons mm. and not liking it. And when she found out, she was absolutely devastated. 
And then he says, but at least we didn't tell her that we didn't like her balloon idea. <laughs> because, you know, what he's saying is we end up actually hurting people much more by just not having that honesty and being compassionate from a place of love. And the, the test is always, can I do this without needing to have a certain response in a certain way? You know, by actually, and this is what this is what um, Brene Brown talks about quite a lot, is being able to put yourself out there from that place of vulnerability, knowing that it's the best thing to do for the people around you, for the organisation, whatever, and not needing to have that validation back, you know, because you know you're doing it from a place of love. You know you're doing it for the best. Mm. I hope that makes sense and answers. Yeah, 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 it does. That. Yeah, it does. Uh, okay, so uh, you, you're then you're the se- the second one you went to after compassion then was forgiveness, and you said that that's that can be equally for forgiveness of yourself and or others. Is that right? Yeah. So all of them you can use with yourself and others. Oh, okay. Sorry, um, I, I misrepresented that distinction. No, no. And <laughs> um, so if you take compassion, for example, when you use it with yourself, it's about self-compassion. You know, it's about mm. being kind to yourself, giving yourself time um, to maybe reflect every day or time for yourself to just enjoy something that you enjoy doing. You know, so many people that are amazing at their jobs that I work with just do not spend time doing anything good, nice for themselves. Um, self-compassion and obviously that's become more important than ever hasn't it in the last 12 months um and obviously compassion and empathy and um, putting yourself in someone else's shoes but forgiveness yes self-forgiveness is one of the hardest things it, it's mm. very hard to forgive others when you think that they have wronged you or hurt you or done something that's against something that's really important to you the key thing about forgiving others is that you know we we hold on to that burden ourselves and actually you know that's a weight that we hold not them we think that by holding on to that, I'm not going to forgive them, that that somehow will teach them the lesson that they need. But actually, we hold on to that burden and we should be letting that go because it, it doesn't make a difference to them that we hold mm. on to that. Yep. Um, and, you know, a forgiveness in the business sense I often talk about is finding the ways to be able to move on. I use yep. compassion and forgiveness quite a lot in, in the business point of view is to say, seek to understand and not to blame. And we, we, we're so quick to blame. We're so quick to make judgments about another team, about, you know, if someone's missed a deadline, if people have not done something and we need them to have done it, if emails are sent in a certain way or, you know, whatever. And we, we're just so quick to, to judge and to blame. And actually, you know, compassion and forgiveness work really lovely together because you seek to understand and find out what's gone wrong and then not to blame, but actually to say, what can we learn? Which brings in another of the strategies, which is learning. Okay. And what can nice, we learn? Nice link. I like exactly. that we did. <laughs> How can we kind of just let go, which is what forgiveness is all about, let go so that we can move on and actually focus on the things that we all want to be doing every day, not mm-hmm. harboring things that are actually unhelpful for us, making a, maybe making us less effective or less collaborative or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, yes, moving on swiftly to the learning. Um, learning is... Learning is kind of linked to the understanding that when we realise that we're on this journey of just learning every day, it's an immensely empowering thing. Um, you know, I, lo- I love the, I just find it a very freeing concept that actually what we're doing all the time isn't necessarily then for us to judge how good it was or how bad it was, whether we failed or succeeded whether we've won or whether we've lost but actually it's about what do I want to learn from that to take forward to the next thing mm-hmm. wouldn't it be amazing if we could all think like that we were so I know I am I'm so you know I've got so many judgments about myself you know my own worst critic you know I know many of my clients are very successful people you know a lot mm-hmm. of us do do that and um, and there's nothing wrong with all of those feelings of course because they can actually be helpful and they can be motivating but learning is about realizing that actually it is about that ongoing journey and that I often use humility with learning together another of the strategies humility I, is what, about... I don't need to be here as a host I don't think anymore <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just leave you to it <laughs> it's just that some of them just go so nicely together no I know I know, I know. sorry um, I'm teasing I was with the client this week who you know we used humility and learning together so you know, actually going into maybe a new role or taking on a new challenge um, 
that might be feeling daunting and, and that feeling of doubt and you know whether you call it imposter syndrome or whatever that feeling of am I going to be good enough am I mm. potentially going to be able to prove myself what will people think of me it's actually about saying you know humility is saying none of us are perfect we are not robots we are human and you know the amount of years I've done I use Hogan psychometrics with people and I when they've done the psychometric and we do the so what does this mean then we do a one page what are my three strengths what are my three areas of development my weaknesses and it shows the, the fact that and I say I've done hundreds of these and every single person has three on the left and three on the right we are all just made up of this stuff that we do well and this stuff that we're always working on. We will mm. never be perfect. We should never aspire to be perfect. So why can't we just admit to not be perfect? Mm. And humility is about being able to say with that courage of vulnerability to say, you know, I'm, I'm coming into this new job and, I, and I, I haven't actually, I'm very experienced at loads of things, but I haven't actually done this bit before in this business. And, you know, come on, team let's go on this journey together and help me yeah, as much yeah. as I can help you and um, and if you think that I've perhaps not done something in the way that's really helpful for you please tell me and let's work it through together and you know humility is about owning that vulnerability it's about owning the fact that we're not perfect it's owning my strengths owning my weaknesses and just saying this is me and it doesn't mean you know like sometimes and we've all said this and we've heard people say it, I'm sure oh well that's me yeah, you know yeah. and yeah. you won't change me and I I, <laughs> I did work for someone once that said that to me I think he said something like earlier on in the days he said Sarah you've got all this wonderful HR stuff and all these psychometrics I think you might know who I'm going on about yeah but he said but you'll you'll never change me <laughs> and he just sounded so proud I mean I loved him bless him and he was amazing yeah but he just was like so proud this is me but Actually, what's really powerful is when we can just own the stuff that we do really well and the stuff that we just will continue to develop and work on. I just find that really powerful and, and empowering. Mm -hmm. um, and to be able to embrace vulnerability as a culture, you know, to, that's what I'm doing with one of my clients at the moment, actually. And it's it's just so wonderful to see. And it, it's taken some time, you know, but it starts with the leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, we did, a, we, like I say, we did a session this week where they were sharing their strengths to we, what they thought of each other, you know, mm -hmm. what they bring, what they what they detract. Being able to open up, share vulnerability, being OK with not being perfect is a really big thing for us as humans. But it's it's immensely important and it builds trust. I always say humility is one of the biggest trust builders to be able to let go of our egos, to be able to say we don't know or I'm sorry you know I didn't mean to hurt your feelings or I'm sorry that that didn't come across in the way that you know I, I meant it to or you know all of those things when we can when we know how powerful they are they re they can rebuild trust in an instant and it's like I always call it like the super glue of leadership humility mm. but learning is really important with it because as well as saying I'm not always so great at everything to be able to say and what I've learned from that experience or what I've learned from you telling me about what I could be doing even better is that I want to do this even more. Mm -hmm. So please give me feedback about that. So it's immensely powerful to be able to embrace our imperfections and then to also say, and I'm on a journey of continuing to learn and please, you know, let's all help mm -hmm. each other with that. Yeah, definitely. So I've, I've hired uh, over the past six months, I've hired two people into my, um, into my company um and as part of the induction that i put together at the end of each week um or for each week of the kind of welcome to emotional work plan that i have mm -hmm. there are a key set of questions um and and in there for i think week two is um how might i piss you off how might you piss me <laughs> off um I love because that. because I want it to be you know like I, I thought week one might be a bit much so week one is like <laughs> what what do you need to be at your best and week one is what do I need to be at my best and then week two is you know what yeah what what might I do that pisses you off and what might you do that pisses me off um uh, and and then the third kind of component to that is and how are we going to tell each other when we piss each other off because um, I want us to I want us to have that conversation at week two not at week whenever when I piss you know when I piss my my colleague off or my colleague pisses me off I want us to agree dead early 
how we tell each other when we've pissed each other off. You know, that might be different for different people, you know, so so um, not necessarily now, but someone who used to work for me said, can you text me if I piss you off? Um, and, and then and so we can arrange a call. But I but I really I want to know that I've done it. I don't want to come into I don't want to have a call with you and think that we're having like a one to one or we're having a nice call when actually it's I've pissed you off call. So can you tell me that the call we're having is about that I've pissed you off? And I was like, yeah, we can, as long as that call is really quick after the text. Because what I don't want to do is text you or you piss me off and then not have a call for like two days and have you <laughs> stewing over the fact that I'm telling you you pissed me off. You know, so yes, I can do it, but could we have the call really quickly so that you know you don't so that we, we know where we're at and we know kind of what we're doing. But that kind of yeah, that that for me it's about how do we have those tricky conversations so we don't feel clunky and it doesn't feel awkward when we do it because we've already agreed this is the way we're going to do it. Absolutely. And one of the things that came out of this group team leadership, the leadership team, sorry, session this week was mm. somebody said afterwards, you know what, having got we I was really dreading it. Most people were dreading it beforehand, but you know, having got all of this out of the way now wasn't as bad as I thought and also now we all know what you know pisses each other off yeah. we can then continue to keep telling each other that you yeah. know but we know that we can do it and it's going to be okay and it was so it was just really powerful because they all they all felt the love in the room when they were all telling each other you know the lovely things yeah. because actually we don't spend enough time doing that I agree. Um, and that's one of the things about enthusiasm, which is the one of the other um, strategies. And I guess a little bit about gratitude. We don't spend enough time thinking about when we've done something really great or, you know, giving people feedback about what we appreciate about them, which is gratitude, for example. Mm. And they all, you know, they all felt actually probably more uncomfortable hearing the great things mm -hmm. than they did because they're so used to processing and hearing the negative. And, you know, we look out for the negatives, don't we? We have a yeah, yeah. You know, we're always attuned to the sort of the, the threats more than we are the lovely things but it was just lovely at the end then for them to say that you know let's continue to really open up and talk to each other about this stuff about when you've done something that's really annoyed me or I think has been really unhelpful yeah. we've done it now hard bits out of the way definitely all right so you mentioned enthusiasm so the two we haven't talked about yet then are enthusiasm and hope so yes um do you want to talk about enthusiasm first and then we'll do hope yeah so enthusiasm is um enthu one of the most powerful things about enthusiasm is it's so infectious um i remember um you know andy cope who who wrote uh, the art of being brilliant yeah. he uh, went to one of his workshops many years ago and it, it was the first time i'd heard the phrase mood hoover you know um <laughs> And we can all call them different things. I mean, I've heard psychic vampires, you know, we've all yeah, heard yeah. all these phrases. I, I, I remember the psychic vampire one as well. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we know how infectious that can be when it's on the other side. You know, when it's when it's more unhelpful, it you can feel it and it oozes. And actually it works the other way. And, you know, when when um, I think it was Winston Churchill said, you know, enthusiasm is the ability to go from one failure to another. Um, no, that's it. Sorry rewind can you rewind this bit phil yes yeah, of course yeah up. hang on there you go, right, right, right. I go. <laughs> success let's start again success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm mm. and it's just a really powerful thing you know i suppose it's you know you might call it you know positivity um you know in a in a drive motivation but it, you know, when you when you can ooze that about something, when you can try and find the positives, we often look for the negatives. You know, we we mm. can sometimes get into, you know, it might be moments or you know days we can get into a funk or whatever, and we just we just look for the things that aren't that great, and we don't realise how much we're doing it, and we don't realise the impact it can have on others. And as a leader, it's really it can be so encouraging to remember. That that excitement, that enthusiasm is is so important, and that let's let's try and find a positive in here. Let's try and find something that might make us feel joyful or happy. And things in there are things like laughter, you know. And there's so mm. much research that's been done about joy, laughter, you know. Even just I was um, hearing the other day, you know, just even propping your, the sides of your mouth up with your fingers to a false smile 
can actually send chemicals through our bodies that can help us in many ways, you know, and, and mm. just things like that. So enthusiasm is, you know, I, I think it's also, enthusiasm is also important. I was with a, a coaching client where they'd lost their mojo a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I've, I've been with a client where they lost their mojo in their job, generally, having been through sort of a period of overwhelm and stress. Um, but also a, a person the other day that just lost their mojo just coming back after the new year. And, you know, flipping neck, we've just not sorted out this, you know, COVID stuff yet. And mm. we're still not going to be able to get out and see clients. And we're still not going to be able to see suppliers. And we're still... And, you know, that helping them to be able to... And this links with hope. Yep. Um, helping them to be able to reimagine their goals, rethink about what is it I'm trying to achieve? What was the intention of what I was trying to do in my role? What, what makes me feel absolutely amazing? What makes me buzz in my job? Mm-hmm. When do I feel at my happiest? Um, and just reconnecting emotionally with why you even started it in the first place. Why did you take up that job? Why did you enter that profession? What is it you love about what you do? And when we can, when we can allow ourselves to reflect and sort of try to reconnect, because what can happen is it's all there still, but it's just been overshadowed by some of these fear-based feelings. Mm. Um, they do this in um, marriage therapy, don't they? They they ask a couple, you know, after many many years, you know, to sort of what was it you first <laughs> attracted first by, by yeah. that person? Yeah. yeah. Um, and they, you know, they get couples to kind of re- revisit, you know, what you did in the early days and, you know, date nights and do, you know, write each other little notes or, you know, remember what you initially fell in love with about that person. And it's a similar sort of thing. So there's a lot more to enthusiasm than kind of meets the eye. But it's and it's linked very much with hope because hope, you know, from a psychological perspective, it is so. There's something that's so. That, that, that can keep us going every day mm. when we can feel a sense of what it's all for um you know I've, I've recently been um using the model from Patrick Lencioni's book The Truth About Employee Engagement mm-hmm. um he talks about the three elements of job misery and he he talks about um he talks about the fact that you know in his experience over the years you know I'm a bit of a fan of Patrick by the way it's coming out isn't it yeah I love it I love the simplicity <laughs> of what he talks about you know as you can tell with my model and I, I just like things that are easy for me to grasp to be honest because you know mm-hmm. when there's a lot of other things going on I like things that go in easy and um, so yeah I, I love the he talks about um the three elements of job misery because basically what he's saying is you know we often have this thing in our minds about oh you know that job must be brilliant you know wouldn't it be great to have that job um mm-hmm. And we think, oh, I'd be happy if I was doing that job. But what he was saying is actually you could be somebody, you know, working as a, you know, I don't know. What would, what would people think is an amazing job? I don't know. Whatever. Uh, well, I don't know. For the money, you'd probably go professional football player. Um, there you go. Or for the reward, you might go like a surgeon. You know, for the gratification you would get for, you know, for saving lives or you might have or like an airline pilot maybe yeah constantly up in the sky and you know seeing the world from above and seeing different parts of the world maybe some of those or is it maybe that's just mine <laughs> no I love that I love that completely get that so wouldn't you think then that everybody would be happy in those jobs hmm. yeah. but they're not no and what he was saying is you know there must be something else then there's obviously got to be something underneath all of this and what I love is that having done you know years and years of employee engagement and you know we all talk about it a lot and we all you know I don't say we struggle but we're all on a journey of you know doing whatever we can to make sure that people are as engaged as they can be at work and that's you know Mm. a great thing for us all to be working on and, and working hard to do but I love the fact that he just boils it down to three things and um you know some of this actually links to the Gallup you know stuff that that the research they've done but he talks about irrelevance in mm. measurement and in anonymity and the relevance is that kind of where you you know you just feel like your job needs to matter that it's all for something that it makes a difference in some way 
you know, and I remember one of the things I learned early on in HR was that, you know, telling people in the business, we must make sure that people who are, you know, at in a reception role feel that their job is just as important as the CEO, mm. that they are equally as important in our organization and the, and the impact that they add, they need to feel that. And hope, hope is about engaging when you do it with others. So with yourself, it's about goals and mm. being, you know, really thinking about what you want to achieve and how you want it to look. And that can be linked with visualization, which again is another very powerful psychological tool, which can help us to be more engaged and it help us to achieve our goals more successfully. Um, but in terms of with your team, it's about actually involving them in, well, this is the vision that I have. This is what I want us to achieve. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how do you see that in your own words? What does the vision mean to you? What is it that, what is it that would be really important for you about what we achieve as a team or an organization? And what does that mean for you in your day-to-day -day job? You know, how does your day-to-day -day job make a real difference to what we're doing? And that work, that real engagement, getting people to really see the importance of what they're doing and how it makes a difference can be a very powerful motivator. Mm. And that's all linked to hope. There's a lot more to all of these things, as you can see. There are yes. lots, lots yeah. of examples you can use them for. But yeah. what they do is they guide you to explore. That's how I'd, that's really what I want people to use it for is to, let's use these principles, techniques, um, you know, strategies. Let's explore what that means then for you and how you can use them in your day-to-day -day leadership, in your team, in your business, in your life. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what I want to do is to start kind of pulling us together. So mm. in a minute, I'm going to ask um, you know, some of my classic questions for closing the, the, the podcast down around how should people get in touch with you and, and those sorts of things. Um, and, and what I've deliberately tried to do as we've worked our way through is to kind of, because uh, I was thinking about how to structure the podcast in advance because I should be like do the model first and then stuff after. And, and I, I wanted to... to to explore the 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 uh, the experiences, the stories, the the the, th the real life things that sit behind all of these, because I think mm. you you can we could have list we could have described the model and listed all of the components, and that would have been lovely. But I, I deliberately wanted to to I guess structure the whole episode to cover the whole model with with you bringing it to life along the way if that makes sense so mm. um that's what i've tried to do um as we've worked our way through so i, I hope fair listener that um that that, uh, that that's come across uh, for you as well um so before i move into closing us off then is there anything that you haven't said about the model that you want to say before i bring us um, on to the next phase um I think I think you know what you've done is you've um you've just given me like you say you've given me that opportunity to kind of work our way through everything um and I, I feel so as you asked me that question I feel complete I feel like I've you know okay. gone we've, we've we've fulfilled the sort of the overall picture there is so much more to it all but as an overview and as a you know that, that's felt that's felt really good so I hope it's I hope it has been helpful for people listening and yeah thank you yeah and we'll put we'll put as i said we'll put a link to the visual in the show notes we'll also put a link to the book um so we'll put a link to, to your book into the show notes as well um and then i'll also you know all the other things we talked about so i'll put for example uh, links to the books that you've mentioned i'll put a link to nikki v's site because you said that you worked with nikki v for a while oh, as no, part of it um i'll put yeah. the links into the ted talks that you talked about as well the Valencioni one and the brownie brown ones so I'll, I'll put links to all of those um, so all of those things in the one? Yes, of course. For yeah, yeah. I don't know if you listened to this podcast, but it was um, Louis Theroux. He does Grounded. I don't podcast. Nope. I don't know if you listen to any of them. No, no, that's not. That's Have you heard of him? You know him? I know who he is. Yes, but I, didn't, I haven't yeah, listened to his podcast. Yeah. Interviews people, but he, he kind of does it in a very sort of down to earth. Let's get underneath mm. what this is really about. Maybe some controversial things. But he did a, a Grounded podcast. Um, I listened to it the other week with Ruby Wax. So um came across 
Ruby just recently, actually, because she's doing some sort of mindfulness. She's into mindfulness now and teaching yeah. people how to be mindful. And it's lovely. Um, she's so funny. And But what I really loved about this podcast was just the vulnerability. I mean, I actually at times just felt like I was intruding mm. on a very open and uncomfortable conversation with them both but they were so honest about it mm. and that vulnerability I guess is, is a great example of that in that podcast you know she 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 was basically saying you know for years I couldn't even stand your name and you know I've, I've paraphrasing this but you know I was yeah. literally felt like I could be physically sick when I had to give you an award because I just felt like you were a competitor and I was very jealous and because she's so raw and open mm. and he basically said at the beginning, I feel a little bit uncomfortable, Ruby, because I know that you've said this about me. I heard you said this and I don't know where it's come from. What have I done? And it all just came out and I just loved it for that. I loved that honesty and that rawness and just loved them both for it. And they were just amazing, both of them, in, in holding that space together in that rawness of mm. her being very open about some of her mental health struggles as well. And, you know, she's obviously processed a lot of that emotion, which was why she's able to talk about it in a very mm. helpful way. But, you know, just being that open with him and and him being vulnerable with her too, you know, about his vulnerabilities. And, yeah, it's a great example of vulnerability, um, which I loved. I could listen to it many times because of that. Yeah, OK. Well, I will definitely put a link to that. In the show. <laughs> just love it. Be Thank awesome. you. Um, okay, so if people do want to get in touch with you, um, how would you like them to do that? What would be the best way for people to get in touch with you if they wanted to pick up a conversation or they wanted to explore power of love leadership with you some more? I think, um, I mean, you know, I have an email, I've got powerofloveleadership.com website, but um, I think the easiest thing is probably LinkedIn. I talk to people a lot on LinkedIn. You okay. might not be on LinkedIn. So if you're not on LinkedIn, um, can send me an email i don't know if you're able to put the email on there yeah i can put the email link. address in the show notes yeah yeah that's fine I yeah, can do yeah, that. yeah yeah so yeah. email if that's easier but linkedin i don't know i think i think for me certainly in the last 12 months not that i wasn't on linkedin anyway but you know it's it's a lovely way to just keep in touch with people and just say hi you okay. know so that's a that's fine by me wonderful we should do that um, my other questions then about what would you recommend for people to kind of, um, you know, any books or things like that you would recommend? We've picked up all of those, I think, as we've worked our way through, we've, and we'll put the Louis through one on, um, the Louis through one on as well. <clears throat> but is there anyone that you think um, we should seek out to get on the podcast? Is there anyone that you think, you know what, if you were to get this person on, I think that would make a really interesting listen. Is there anyone you would recommend or suggest that we should get on the podcast? Um, do you know I, I I know you sort of um, mentioned this before, and I haven't given it much thought, and I'm really sorry. That's all right. So um, yeah, but I will have a think. Have a think and, and let, let me know. You know. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Apologies for that. No, it's all right, though. Um, and then, is there anything else? Then, is there anything else that you are thinking, feeling, or want to say before I, before we close? Just thank you so much. Um, this is just such a, it's such a personal, you know, it, it's really important to me um, to share this. It's actually a very uncomfortable thing the more I do it. You know, I, okay. I really, like I say, I'm having to really get used to that vulnerability, as yeah. I was saying earlier, um, yeah. because, you know, you, I've created something and I'm putting it out there. But it's, it's just such a, I just have found, you know, the more I use it, the more we talk about it, the more we open up the conversations. I've just really, you know, thank you for, you know, doing the podcast and thank you for listening, who's, who, are, who you are that's listening. Um, and let's just talk more about this stuff. Thank Absol you. Absolutely. That's what a wonderful way to close. All right. In that case, then, Sarah, thank you so much for coming um, on the podcast today. And yeah, it's been wonderful. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've been listening to the Emotion at Work podcast. And if you got this far, you must be interested in the role that emotions have in the workplace, either within individuals, between people in teams or in organisations as a whole. So head over to the Emotion at Work hub, which you can find at community.emotionatwork.co.uk. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.